activity. My name is Marcos Jimena. I'm a um, consulting systems engineer consulting systems engineer in um, in for EMER and I'm based as you can hear uh, my accent I'm based in Madrid and big fan of Atletico de Madrid just uh, irrelevant comment I d couldn't avoid <laughs> so let's start the switching innovation uh, uh, both Ivor Sean and Scott will help me from the BU right so um, for questions panelists uh, they will help me with, with any doubt you might have uh, around this session. So let's start um, switching innovation. So you had, by the way, a pretty good introduction from Ivor the first day in the common track. We are going to try to go a little bit deeper. Uh, and this should work, right? Anyway, let's do it the uh, whole way. So let's start with the agenda, so core and aggregation, high-end access. We will see what we mean with high-end access, high-volume access, software innovation, and best practice to sell 9Ks, right, at the, at the end. As always, there is much more content that I can cover in 60 minutes. So the plan was either I could hide some slides and reduce the, the number of slides, either I could go a little bit quicker on those that I think they are not so relevant because this content you will have it later on, so you can go deeper into it. Okay, so I prefer to, to leave all the slides as they are, as they were in the original content, and probably I will go a little bit quicker through some of, of them. Okay, don't, don't, don't panic. You will have all, all the information. Core and aggregation. Okay, so let's start. CAD9K Foundation. This is probably, to be honest, the most important slide of the presentation. I mean, everything we innovate from now on will be based on one of these three pillars. Our operating system, our programmable ASIC UADP, and our CPU now, since CAD 9K based on X86. So why is this so important? Because it could be irrelevant either for you, either for your customers, for other customers. These are like techie details that nobody cares about. This is extremely important, right? iOS XC, and let me try to give you some tips that I personally, I'm not at the BU, I'm sales, I'm in front of the customer as you are uh, every day, right? So I try always to take these technical details and try to translate to something relevant to our customers. So why they should care having iOS XE in their network or having this new open iOS XE Polaris in their network. You know that you, we used to have iOS, so monolithic operating system, very uh, feature-rich operating system, but monolithic, right? Not flexible at all, closed, not programmable, and so on. We moved to iOS XE, and we integrated or we developed the uh, modularity concept. So since then, it was an iOS daemon running on top of a, a Linux kernel. This was already good because I could run this iOS with all the features I used to have in iOS, but in a modular daemon, so modularized. But we now go further, and now we have an even a higher degree of modularity and of openness. So the three main advantages I encourage you to use in front of your customers. Single image, single ISXE image for all CAD 9K platforms. Access, distribution, POE, no POE, 24 ports, 48 ports, aggregation, 40 gig, 100 gig, single iOS image. We know it's a challenge to manage a network with different components, features. You cannot know exactly what feature is supported in what platform until now. Life cycles of that iOS, hey, when are you going to release your next maintenance release? Depends. What iOS do you have? What platform do you have? So now all this is simplified having a single uh, image. You can qualify, important message, an image for all your campus. Access, aggregation, and core. Qualify a single image for all your campus. So this is an advantage, right, for your customers and for yourself. Open, it's open. What does it mean? Well, we are very aligned with what Gardner and the market is demanding. This um, um, intent-based network system that Gardner is talking about, 
basically saying every IT or networking vendor should develop an operating system which is open, which has REST APIs to be accessible, configurable in a standard way. This is what iOS XC is. It's open, REST APIs, I can configure, automate via NetConf and Young models. Okay, so we comply with this trend of the market for the next coming years. Um, modular, extremely modular in the sense that we can even do patching, right? So I can upgrade, solve a piece or a certain bug without needing to upgrade my whole iOS XE image. This will come, okay? So again, I qualified a single image, a certain release for your, my customer. I know their needs. I know what image is stable in case there is a bug or a piece I cannot have to requalify for my next release. I can just upgrade that patch that solves that issue. So modularity. Okay, yeah. When, it, when will that be available? Patching without uh, affecting the service? Hot patching? The, okay, so the question was, when is this going to be hot patching available? 16.9, which means July 2018. So, single image, open, modular. There is a fourth one that normally we don't see in this presentation that I like to mention. You know that iOS XE started to run on the ASRs 1K, our routers, extremely successful router. So, we inherit a lot of the features that were already available on that code. So now we have ASRs, ISRs, CAT 4Ks, CAT 9Ks, sharing a lot of the operating system features. We do support MPLS on the 3Ks and 9Ks. How can that happen? The field asked MPLS in the 4Ks for many years, never happened. It was too costly. We were not prepared to invest so much resources in making this feature happen. In the 3K, Cisco did it like this. Why? It was already on the code. And by the way, we had a programmable ASIC to do it in hardware. So this gives me <laughs> the opportunity for the next step. So got it. So ISXC, open ISXC, Polaris, you see how relevant it is. And those messages are really relevant for our customers. UADP. We insisted a lot on this, our programmable ASIC. Well, basically, we have an ASIC, hardware, line rate, speed, which is programmable, which has all the features of a CPU. You know, between the CPU, programmable and slow to an ASIC, very quick, but with fixed uh, features uh, embedded. Now we have the best of both worlds. Okay, so it's a programmable ASIC. We have a pipeline with a lot of stages where the package comes in with a flex parser. It depends on engineering at Cisco what features I will develop in that UADP ASIC. So we are ready to adapt ourselves, to adapt these devices to what the market is going to demand. This is the key message. It's very powerful. I mentioned MPLS, VXLAN, other features I think that we will cover through the presentation, but the main message here is we will even be able to do things that we don't even exist today. I think this is the key. So the protection of the investment is huge, right? Not only because it's supposedly Cisco, you know, it's robust platforms, it's because it will be ready to adapt to features, to standards that don't exist today. How? Because I can program that UIDP. So that's the, that's the message. Um, X86 CPU, again, huge difference versus Cavium and other CPUs we used to have. On switching platforms, as you know, the CPU was not so important. We made everything in hardware. Actually, we used to have pretty slow CPUs in the past and pretty uh, close CPUs, right? Everyone develops applications on X86. So this is the reason we will be able to support third-party application hosting together with the modularity of the iOS XC. If it's modular and I can embed, have containers with applications developed for x86, I have the complete solution. Okay? So let's move on. Any questions so far? Okay. 
UADP 3.0, well, basically, this is our next generation UADP ASIC. You know, we started with 1.0, with the first 3850 generation. We evolved to 2.0, now we have 3.0. And let me give some details. Uh, well, more transistors, much more smaller transistors, so 16 nanometers technology, a lot of information in internet and in other Cisco Live presentations. Again, the smaller the better, in the case of ASICs, I mean, and less consumption, more power for the same space. Again, 20 billion transistors, this is huge. I'm not sure about the previous version, seven and a half in 2.0 billion. So to 20 billion, right? So, and by the way, I'm not sure about the size, but might be a little bit more bigger, right? So huge uh, investment, I'm great. We are really proud of our UADP ASIC. Of every ASIC we did, we always made ASICs, even in the two case, okay? Always playing with this number of transistors and nanometer technologies. So we are really proud, since we're really proud about this UADP, which has that 1.6 tera um, bandwidth. So amazing. Um, this is also the ASIC that permits our stacking capabilities. So when we say 480 gig stack-wise, it's actually these ports related to the UADP. It's the one that permits having 40 gig or 100 gig technology, or the recirculation to have implemented hardware speed, MPLS, or VXLAN or other encapsulation techniques that needs uh, encapsulation and so on and so forth. A huge topic, very interesting, and really one of the pillars uh, that justify our innovation. And this is important, and why we sometimes want to talk about this to our customers, that they should not care, actually. It's because, and this is a personal comment, when we say we do this and that, it's not magic. It's not marketing. It's not a sales pitch. When we talk about this, we are explaining how we do that, okay? Because having fabric solution, programmable ASIC, anyone can say the same. Actually, they are doing and saying the same. So we need to prove, to give concrete information that to demonstrate that this is not magic, this is not marketing, this is reality. By the way, talking about uh, others doing other things, for UADP, and again, something that I normally use a lot. Um, okay, I heard that others are doing programmable ASICs. The thing is, the question is, what features post-launch of that ASIC did they develop so they can demonstrate that they have a programmable ASIC? We do. Actually, VXLAN didn't exist when we developed UADP. This took us Three years, it was already five years ago, so eight years ago, VXLAN didn't exist. And now we have VXLAN, as you know, for fire fabric. MPLS, another good example. ER span. ER span was unique to the 6K. Why? Because the, the, the FPGA was programmed to, to support. We could, because engineering decided to do that, but they can prioritize other features that they see in the market. So you see how important it is to give concrete examples of features that didn't exist when this UADP was launched and that we decided to integrate. So, and from a platform perspective, uh, the 9500H, uh, Ivor did introduce it in, the, in the, the first day, in the common session. So, nice, right? Um, 40 gig, 100 gig, single rack unit devices. How is it possible? UADP 3.0. Again, no magic, uh, line rate, and with all the capabilities you can see on your right-hand side. I will not spend too much time here, but basically this is our new um, standalone 32 ports, one, uh, 100 gig, 40 gig. Why 40 gig, 100 gig? It will depend on the optic adapter, and actually it will also support uh, 10 gig, right? And this might be roadmap, but selecting the right optics, I will have an aggregation or core platform able to facilitate migration from 10 gig to 100 gig. 
in one single right unit. So very interesting uh, platform. As it is based on UADP 3.0, now you have a lot of information. You can conclude that it does 3.2 terabits per second. By the way, why 3.2? Remember how much did the UADP 3.0 do? 1.6, right? This means that we have two UADP A6 on this platform. Okay, these are the type of conclusions that you sell. You will be able to understand what you see the specifications of the devices. As far as I know, any can operate 4,000. It will depend on the uh, SFP. Generally speaking, you put. As far as I know, yes, right? If they are completely independent, correct. Yes, sorry. The question was, uh, first of all, if we use templates to decide what ports operate at 40 or 100, no, every port can be 40, 100 gig. It will depend on the optic uh, QSFP uh, that, I, that I connect. The second question was if there is any dependency of these ports to be grouped that I have. If I have one port you know, at one speed, the next four ports, for example, need to be at the same speed. The answer is no. They are completely independent. Okay? Sorry, let, before your question, 10 gig as well. Breakout cables, we will see that in the next slide, okay, to, to convert one 40 gig port in four ports of 10 gig. This will also be supported. QSA. So again, QSA. When I say 10 gig, it's QSA based. And another additional feature is breakout only for 10 gig, by the way. There is no one gig in breakout cables as far as I know. Yes, um, regarding this switch, I believe that that is in the core. That will that design, this switch? Is that in design as a core switch? Or how must I see this now? Okay, the question is where do we position this uh, device? It's a core switch. Now, let's define core or aggregation. Yeah. Uh, might be synonyms, right? Depending yeah. on what you, what you understand by core. Or but this is really core in the sense that the, the, the high density, the speed, the VSL, by the way, solution we will have for high availability, redundant power supplies, redundant uh, um, fans. So this is really a, a core, standalone core solution. Dual style, are you talking about IPv4, IPv6? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very low? Long. Long, okay. Huh? I'm not sure about the routing table these devices will support. The TCAM did increase, but do you know how many addresses we support both? IPv4, IPv6. That's an important comment, right? Before V6, same numbers. We don't cut in a half because the size, the width of the table is the same and the amount of entries are the same. You see, before we had to have certain number of entries in V4. In V6, we had, we, because we occupy, but the number of, of routes, Okay, we will see. Again, it's not the power, the muscle, okay, of the device is not always related with the size of the table because this is for a core campus router that will have a lot of speed with a fair amount of IP addresses, even if BTP learned. So they are looking at it.
So the question is, if this hosts application, what kind of applications are we hosting? Um, any, in the sense that this could be Cisco applications or third-party applications. The ones we are more interested at, we think, are the third-party applications to give value and to customize that network, that platform, to the business priorities of that customer. You see my point? So we have certain applications, actually the wireless part, and we had it before in non-open iOS XE, as you know, with a, even the controller embedded on the, on the iOS XE and so on. We, so we could run, we could decide to run our application, but I think the main message here, and basically this is also the reason to have x86 as an advantage, is for that third-party applications to, again, being able to offer a flexible, agile, and customized network to your customer. So at some point, so before in the past, and this is again my view after some years in, in, in this market, we offered from Cisco, let's say very feature-rich platforms, right? Platform that had a lot of things on it. I might use them or not, but the point is that we didn't give the right tools to enable to adopt them, right? Now this is changing via a software approach. So we are still bringing very, very feature-rich platforms, but now together with this platform, we are giving the right tool, I'm talking about the controller, DNA center, the so on, to enable those, those features, that, that uh, encryption, that visibility, those things that I had before, that segmentation, <laughs> that Cisco traffic, we had that be since many years, but we didn't have the right tool to enable it via software very quick, right? So the point here is that uh, the other thing is that that network customers or the market had to adapt themselves to what the vendor was offering. If it supports certain number of VLANs, I will do certain number of VLANs. If it supports routing, I will do routing. If not, I will not do routing. The message here is that now that same platform you and partners, this is why you are so important here, you will be able to convert that same switch that another customer has in a completely different box via programmability, via having applications, uh, hosting capabilities. And this is why now it's not just selling boxes with a number of ports, it's selling a network with some value to that customer that might be a hospital, a university, or a public sector customer that has nothing to do, and they will have the same device probably. I don't know. No, no. So the question, sorry, the question was if it was a, a good use case to have a, a virtual uh, network services from Cisco even in these devices, yeah. like a firewall, for example. Yeah, yeah so um, as I mentioned, the VMs are KVM. The containers are LXC or Docker containers. Um, the CPU itself, the CPU happens to be four core CPUs. Two of the cores are used by uh, OpenIS XE, which means that you have two cores to dedicate for the purposes of applications running in containers. The nice thing also is the memory itself. You can also dedicate a block and say, okay, for this application, I've got, I don't know, four gigs of memory, for example, right? So that's the, so it runs in a very deterministic environment, right? So, uh, and, and it has no negative impact on the forwarding of the switch itself, right? Because it's dedicated resources. Um, so the kind of applications we're looking at is, Um, let's see, so as I mentioned, um, so the, the container types are um, the do Docker containers, and there are thousands and thousands of different applications out there running on Docker. Um, some of the things that we've shown, 
are things like, uh, if any of you have been to Cisco Live in Vegas, or that, for example, uh, we showed a few things. Firstly, we showed um, iPerf as an application, just downloadable from anywhere, right? Open source application. We showed uh, Perfsonar. A lot of the applications we're looking at are things like analytics related. Some are security related, like Snort, right? Snort is an IDS, IPS application that we run. Um, but your specific question related to firewall. Firewall is a pretty intensive, um, you know, in terms of resource intensive. So typically, you don't, we don't have enough resources, per se, on the box uh, in order to really run a full firewall on it, right? And so really, the idea we're getting to is more of a lightweight type application. It's really something, uh, maybe a term you're familiar with, is uh, something called fog computing, right, where you run lightweight applications distributed in the infrastructure, and uh, you basically pull that intelligence together in a cloud-based application or in, like, TNA Center. That's the idea we're going, we're going down. Obviously, some other applications are things like Puppet and Chef. These are um, uh, deployment type applications that's typically been used in the data center for provisioning of servers and things like that. Uh, but I think the bulk of it is really focused around where all this traffic is going through the box, right? Through the switches anyway. And as, an, as a result, we want to take advantage of the fact that, uh, you know, we can get additional analytics around it. We can get, in some cases, some security related things around it. And we can take advantage of running some, uh, like, um, you know, various different kinds of, of of applications on the box itself. So that's kind of the logic. Firewall, probably not, yeah. unless it's a very lightweight one. Thank you, Ivor. Um, I have How could we that? Sean has his hand. Oh, you are. Time update, so it's huh? That was just for, for here, yeah. But he's in the WebEx. He's in the WebEx. This should work, right? Okay, so the the question uh, a few moments ago. Okay. Yeah. So magic, right? We have the UADP. Yeah, and um, one of the other little items at the bottom of the screen, uh, Marcos just had not had time to get to it yet was talking about uh, flexible, reprogrammable tables. Uh, this is also a very powerful message to give to your customers uh, because not every uh, ASIC memory table is perfect for every customer. Some people want more layer three, some people want more layer two, they want more multicast, these things. Um, so that was the point uh, I wanted to make there. And the reason I say this is what you see are different, uh, can't highlight it in this mode, um, different columns, and the different columns represent the different uh, templates that you can apply to these ASICs. Uh, this is also true for UADP 2.0 and UADP 1.0. Um, when you buy the box, it does come with a default template, and often when we, we create the data sheet, we're making the data sheet on this default template, but you actually can change it. So to answer the question, uh, well, one more point. Uh, it's a total memory table, so it's just a continuous piece of memory, and then we carve out pieces of it for different jobs. This is how we can uh, reprogram it. Um, so to answer the question uh, very straight about the, the number of IPv4 and IPv6 routes, uh, it's the 212 allocated specifically to routes. And then you notice it's the same, uh, we have two numbers there, IPv4 number and then IPv6 number. 
both of them say 212 uh, because it's uh, 288 bits wide. So I can hold both a source and destination 128-bit uh, IPv6 address. Um, and then the other pieces are uh, multicast uh, MAC entries. This is where we also uh, store MAC addresses, uh, your NetFlow, and then uh, people are interested in software-defined access or TrustSec, uh, this SGT label, how I do an IP to SGT number binding. So the total table is actually 412 bits um, of memory. And then you can, as I said, reallocate them to the different pieces. I can also talk about the others, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that that question got answered. Cool? Okay, it was more related to your question yeah. about, and the flexibility of the test. Okay, let's continue. I think we went through three slides. <laughs> and we have 40 more and, and 25 minutes, so let's, let's do our best. But to be honest, this is the type of information I think it's more valuable to share now in 60 minutes with you. Again, the content, you will have it. You will be able to go through it. In, in, at least from my point of view, I will write to out of that, what should I use that information so you can share with your customers. Okay, so it's not a waste of time at all. So I should recover. Um, okay. Yeah. My screen is fine. Yeah. Okay. So let's continue. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, uh, Ivor. Uh, again, quick. This is redundant information, a little bit more uh, specific. Uh, 32 ports, one gig. Let's continue. A lot of buffers and so on. Uh, rear picture. USB Bluetooth dongle for wireless access. Uh, RFID blue beacon. Again, this is type of things that might or might not be very relevant, but it's pretty unique and it's interesting. So the Bluetooth console access, I think it's very, very interesting. I mean, you can tell your customer, forget about that blue flat console cable. Console, you will still need it and have it, but at least you can access the switch via Bluetooth which is very interesting, either to the console, to the CLI, either to the GUI, to the web GUI, wherever, but cableless, right? So very interesting. The RFID, as you know, it's embedded, it's supported already, and for tracking and avoiding human mistakes and errors when tracking all your, your, your switches, interesting, and the blue beacon, that I think we put more blue beacons to detect, select, more parts in the modular switches, this is very interesting, but even in the one rack unit unit, it's very interesting to, for example, replace a certain power supply or a certain um, uh, fan tray, you will have a blue beacon to detect it, to activate it remotely via CLI, wherever, okay? So the scalability of the platform based on the CPU and on the UADP 3.0, it has embedded. The capabilities about uh, speed. Let's continue. This is the 9500s already existing and shipping. Just a quick reminder. So again, the 9500H is just part of this aggregation for 9500 family. Okay. These are based on UADP 2.0. Not big deal. Same thing, but it's a matter of scalability uh, and so on. Um, this one is interesting. Probably you will have to want to have a look, but look at the age part. Some parts and you uh, differentiate it by colors that are roadmap, but the, the, the message here is well, you will have a very flexible, easy to migrate uh, core switch uh, from one gig to, to, to 100 gig. The breakout cables, as you can see, some are planned for March, some others are still roadmap for, for the H uh, platform, but this is basically uh, the capability to convert a 40 gig port into four 10 gig ports. These four 10 gig ports can be 40 gig speed, so they can end in a single switch just to aggregate like an ether channel, or they can be end in different switches, which is the interesting part. So these switches that apparently don't have a very, very big Port density like the 12, the 24, the 32, with breakout cables, they can they can have this amount of ports. 
somehow, right? Four? When is the roadmap? The question is, when is the roadmap? Basically, the bottom right corner box uh, breakout cables to support uh, breakout on the 9508. Yeah. The gray ones, July? Project. July, July. 16.9.1. July, yeah. One gig for breakout is not supported. No, but that's QSA with an SFP that can be SFP or SFP plus. Cor correct, but not with a breakout technology. See the difference? That's why it says 24 or 32 and 12 on the top, because it matches the, num the, the physical ports. But that port can be, it depends on the SFP you put. Correct. The QSA will be the adapter to convert to an SFP, or if you did both things, the adapter and then the SFP or SFP plus. Okay. Question? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Yeah. Uh, good catch. I don't know. The, the, the question is. It's wrong. It's a, it's a typo. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, the question was, uh, someone did the math, and 108 ports with breakout cables is not the same as 32 by 4, which is 128, so it might be a typo. Good point. Thank you. Okay, let's continue again. Lots of things. Again, go through it. Basically, the main difference you see here is based on the UADP version they have. There are some interesting things. So the, 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 the switching capacity and the forwarding is one of the big difference. Dedicated buffer versus shared buffers. And we can have also several discussions here, but I we guess that for a, a, such a huge um, density aggregation switch, having a shared buffer is more optimized, right? If we want to dedicate buffers on 100 gig ports, 32 ports, you see what I mean? We will need a huge amount of dedicated buffers, so share, shared technology are more, of, more optimized for, for these speeds, let's say. Anyway, dedicated network versus shared. You see, maybe as Sean shared, now we don't make any difference between V4 and V6. This is good, I think. This is good, why? Because probably we designed today for V4, the day we have V6, if we, these days will come someday, I don't know, we will have to redesign everything or maybe we have the wrong platform if we want to migrate to V6, okay? Uh, starting soon, EFT actually it's already started, right, uh, Ivor, the, the EFT for this platform. So if you love it, I'm sure you love it and you want to, you have cases, customers that would like to be interested in, in this platform, please reach out to, to us or to your Cisco local contacts. Um, 6,800, so, so only one slide for this topic, the message, no plans to end of life in the following three years or until 2020, 2020, okay? So what, why this message is so important? We know the challenge we have to keep current 6K happy customers and offer them uh, an evolution of this platform. So I think that if from a density and speed perspective, the 6800 fits their needs, keep on going with the 6800, okay? The other alternative that we can offer, it's always good news to have different alternatives. So don't get full and keep on going with 6800 if, if it's worth it and it really fits the, the customer needs. It has a huge value in the sense that this is the platform that probably your customer has been using in the last seven, eight years. He might be probably very happy and he might really want to keep on 
being like that in the following eight years. And this is what right now we are, we are proposing with the 6800. Indeed, the development, the new things, the, the, the very long-term strategy is based on cat 9 case, but okay, no. so this is the message, okay? I sometimes use, again, I'm with you every day, visiting customers and so on. Uh, last um, two months ago, it was the discussion, this 9400, next 7K, at some point, customer wanted 6800. As it is today, it was more than enough for his needs. And I present him a show version where we could see an uptime of 14 years. One, four years, I don't know where I took it from. So probably you, you know some customers like this, right? This is huge, right? And this is at the end what some customers will make them decide to keep on with the platform that, okay, it's not so, but SDA ready, SDA mm -hmm. scalable, it scales a lot in terms of VRFs, uh, tables, and so on. So that's my personal message. Okay. High end access, let's go. 9400, you know, it's our modular um, solution for, for access. Currently, we have the um, data in the UPOE, and we are about um, to launch in March the POE Plus, the 48 SFP, so one gig, and the 24 SFP modules. Okay, this is just a roadmap. Again, this is roadmap, sorry. Centralized, completely centralized, yeah. You know in what chipset? UADP, no, no. Per port, per 10 gigabit ports. Several times of uh, 36 megabytes per, per, per the platform for the centralized. Do you think that it's enough from the point of uh, view of uh, QoS? Having, having 250 megabytes per uh, 10 gig port uh, in contrary with 36 megabytes for platform, for the platform. I prefer to make it short, please. <laughs> yeah, and the question is a, great, and the answer can be. Ooh. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a simple answer, uh, but I do have a relatively simple message, right? QoS and the, the idea of buffering, everything, period, goes into a buffer. There's always buffering. However, it's about in queue, right, bringing the packet into the buffer, and DQ, getting the packet out of the buffer. One of the key messages here is about line rate, right? Now, if you have a platform that is oversubscribed, that's where buffering and QoS becomes very, very important because I can't get the packets, the, the rate that they're coming in queue is more than the rate of DQ. Right, so so that's the very simple message. Is these are all uh, very close to line rate, and uh, you know, in a few examples, uh, depending on soup one, soup uh, one XL, right? Then those no longer uh, become a big issue. Okay. Thanks, Sean. So, and again, this is a platform first of all positioned for access. This is very important. We're talking about access, high-end access. I think we call it this session. It can be for aggregation, of course and now even more that we are launching uh, SSPs so or optic modules. But, uh, but yeah, this is primarily uh, either a, a high-end access or for a small aggregation. This is not a core, high-end density core platform, 9K version, okay? This is also important, probably related to your, your question. Um, Okay, so SFP plus modules available in November, uh, M gig, 24 port M gig UAP, and SUB1 XL. You know SUB1 has 80 gig bandwidth per slot, 
okay? XL has 120 gig. This is why with 120 gig per module and uh, the huge performance of the UADP and the uh, optic module, SFP+, plus. this is why we consider this could be also the same philosophy, the same answer as with the 4500E, right? Depending on your scenario, it can be uh, positioned in both, both ways. These modules, by the way, at least the SFP Plus and the Sub 1XL, it's already in CCW. I just checked yesterday. I started to make some configurations from some customers, okay? What you might be thinking on will come in the next slide with this VSL support, and I will comment that in the next slide. Question? Yeah. I suggest it's the same by the 68 series. Uh, there are, can be two supervisors in there. One is active and one is backup. Is that possible? Yeah. Also here? Yeah. You can have two supervisors. Actually, it will be always the recommendation yeah. uh, in an access switch with such a, such a high density of ports, right? So normally we recommend two supervisors. Yeah. Is they also supporting the uh, VSS, what we have in the 68 series? V support of VSS, this is what I will come in my next slide. Okay. This will come July next year. But very good question, because why? In access, we don't care. In aggregation, it's not, not only we care, it's a must, right? Okay. And let me go to that. This is the MGIG line card, just for your information. Talking about MGIG, again, profit and positioning your customer that we are the vendor that offers more density of a technology that we led and we could make it a standard. So the Enbase T Alliance, as you know, together with all, many other vendors in the market, we were competing with MG uh, Base uh, Alliance and we got it, we could standardize. Now the new Mac Pro uh, supports Enbase T, so MG as you know the wave two access points the first use case so it's a real uh, advantage for us and again we feel proud of offering uh, something that sooner or later will be probably almost be the default the same way we moved from one to, from 10 100 to 10 100 one gig probably in, in in five four seven eight years and it will be pretty the default configuration for access okay so very interesting to start offering today high density MG, even if customer probably has any use case today, but they will have sooner or later. Okay. And this is why also on the 9300, what will come in, in January is our 48 ports, uh, 2.5 gig MG. So we differentiate the first 36 ports, they will go up to 2.5 based on the MG standard, but only up to 2.5. And the last 20, sorry, 12 ports, they will be a full multi-gig from 10 meg to uh, 10 gig, okay? Why is this? This is an architecture design perspective. We don't want to oversubscribe this, uh, this device. This is an access switch. So having this high density of 2.5 gig is what we want. Why? Because we want to go beyond one gig. We don't care here actually about five gig and 10 gig necessarily. In aggregation we do. But here we want really to, if we have this wave two access point going beyond one gig, to be able or to avoid needing either channel or other uh, not so clean technologies, okay? I love this module because of the same reason. Okay, MGIG is great, Marcos, but you know what? Out of my, let's continue with the example of wireless, probably I only have four access points per floor that would justify having MGIG. So why should I buy a 48 ports MGIG switch that will increase my price in my offer? This is a nice solution. Put that module in some of your switches in your stack just to start with MGIG adoption. You know what I mean? Because with four ports, I can probably, you know, give four access point coverage maybe for a four complete plant. And then in the future, if this grows, I will be able to stack in this same uh, 9300 stack uh, a pure MGIG switch. You see my point? Question? Uh, access points because it says a node in the corner, not PoE enabled. Correct. Correct. So sorry for that. <laughs> so M gig, uh, ten gig, let's say copper aggregation, for example. 
which by the way is something that we are starting to use a lot. So M gig, so the going beyond one gig for the wireless or Mac Pro or other PCs that will have this standard is good, but having 10 gig in copper can also be a very nice use case. If we're in the data center, we know we have another architecture, the Nexus-based architecture, but in the campus for a few servers or PCs needing 10 gig in copper, M gig is again something that we are adopting with quite good success. Question? Nine thousand three hundred. Uh, they, they are also stackable. They are stackable. Stackwise. And stackwise. Four hundred eighty. And there uh, can eight switches in there. Until eight, up to eight. And the bandwidth of the stack was. The bandwidth. Yeah, the bandwidth of the. Four four hundred eighty gig. The same as as before. The with same the as before. Yeah. Stackwise. When we call stackwise 480, is mm. that same technology. Same technology. Okay. We cannot mix both families in the same no, stack. No, that's what I know. Okay. I already know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Let's go a little bit quicker, please. And I'm sure. We, oh, sorry. You had a question. Sorry. So as uh, so the the 9K has to replace the 3K, 4K in the future, what about the feature parity between all these switches? Could we today replace uh, 3K architecture with a 9K without any surprise? Without looking at the view, guys, let me respond what I just experienced. So far, there is a big, big percentage of feature parity, but they are not all there. And now I will probably look at them if you have numbers, dates, then we say, hey, 16.9 will be the one. We are close, right? Of course, this is a journey. So this, and this has been two months in the market. So, Yeah, so as Marcus said, can you make it right? So as Marcus said, um, we're basically 99% there already. 16.8.1, which is March, is meant to be the release where we get feature parity, um, at least on the 9300 back to 3850. I think on the, in the case of the 9400, uh, it will be 1691 would be full feature parity. That's the goal. Thank you, Ivor. That's a good question because, of course, I want a proposed migration. I don't want to lose. I want to make sure I don't lose what they need, and I want to propose new things. This is the perfect formula, right, to go to your customer. Let me propose you something different that maintains what you have, what you like, what you need, and at the same time gives you this amount of new new things that we, if we have time, we might be able to see at the very, very end. Uh, what is this? M gig across the 9K portfolio, okay. Uh, high volume access, let me go very quick through this. Okay, Marcos, very nice. We feel comfortable, but you know what? There are some non-SDA low-end projects that we just need to go with a much more lower price uh, uh, switch. This is really our, our proposal. 2960X, the same as I said with the 6800, is still a live device. No end of sales announced at all, at least in the following three years. It's in EMER, and it's something we recall the BU many times, the most sold access switch in Europe, right? Around, I don't know, probably a, a 60 or 70, 30 percent compared with the 3K in the past, right? So we need this switch, we need this platform. It's very competitive, by the way, with the, you know, the full NetFlow capability we gave with the OpenFlow. I think it's still a very interesting platform. And so we, we, we count on it. We integrate a lot of routing capabilities on it as well. And I like the L version, the 2960 L version, if you are even under more price pressure and you need really to compete with switches that not, might not even need to stack, but need PoE plus, need 10 gig uplinks, and so on. We have the 2960L that so far, I think, at least again, a personal comment, permits us to compete pretty well. It has some unique features if you want help to compete in this situation, which is more difficult because at the end, customers just want a certain number of ports POE ready, that's it. So, but we have certain things like uh, over the air management via Bluetooth already embedded and supported. We have the perpetual POE. I think this is becoming very interesting. Remember, even with our software reload, 
my device, even this low end, let's say, device, is able to keep on giving PoE. In IoT environments, it's very interesting in remote offices where you need to reload the switch and probably still keep on uh, giving PoE to some devices that you don't know if you shut them down, if they will recover properly. It's interesting, okay? So again, the switches that are keep on going and with, with some roadmap. Um, compact, let me go very quick, okay, from now on, compact switches. The only message here, and industrial switches, as you know, related to SDA, they are supported as a subtended node, sorry, SD extended node, I think we call it now. So they can be part, the three Ks, and the EA, and the, sorry, and the Catalyst Digital Building and the industrial switches that will come in now, they will be able to integrate in my fabric. Okay, very important. They don't support VXLAN, they don't support them, so how can they integrate? They are subtended. That's why they will integrate somehow via SXP, whatever, they will transmit the policies of that user that will connect and will be part of the fabric. So just keep that message in mind for now, okay? So these are the industrial ones. This is the routing, routed access that we integrated on the 2K, both LAN light, LAN base, and on the 3 Ks with IPACE. So we enhanced the, um, the routing capabilities in these switches. Um, it took us some time. As you know, other vendors did it before. And well, we decided it was the right moment to give these type of features even because they are needed, maybe because they are asked in an RFP. And so just for that reason, we, we wanted to com still compete with these devices, okay? Anyway, this is what we introduced, so routed access in the L version even, without uh, ERP or, or routed access OSPF. You know the difference, routed or access routed OSPF, less number of routes, in one single process as far as I know. Question? A customer uh, and the 2960X in the access layer, and I want to put an aggregation layer in there. Uh, 5500X is an old, old platform, uh, and um, what should I put in there, 9,500 as the aggregation? The question was, if you have 2960X access switch customer and you want an aggregation switch, yeah. which one would you? Yeah, 9,500, 40 port, 10 gig. 95, you want to aggregate in one gig or 10 gig? 10 gig. 9,500, but the 40, the 40 port yeah, yeah, version yeah. or 3850. Yeah, okay. So that's the platform to do that. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have other platforms in fiber. Exactly. So now you have to, to choose between those ones. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, software innovations, MPLS, I already mentioned. Why MPLS? We inherited from the iOS XC operating system. We programmed via microcode on the UADP done. Okay, so very interesting. VPLS as well in the last versions. So either Ethernet over MPLS or VPLS for layer two VPNs. Wide area, bonjour. Stackwise virtual, probably one of the most um, con controversies uh, we have right now. Uh, you have here the roadmap, okay? Uh, be very careful what you position because what we support today on the nine case, as you can see, from a VSL or VSS perspective, now we call it stackwise virtual, SWV, okay? It's only on the 24 port for uh, Q version. The rest of the 9500 will be supported in March, okay? So write down in your head um, and, and make your planning accordingly. The 9400 will come in 16.9, which is July. Sorry? 9300, I'm not aware. Is there any roadmap for 9300? But any plans, no, at this moment? It's on the roadmap, but it's going to be 
look what we have, right? So let's solve this first and it might come. I don't know, might have, might have a lot of sense. By the way, I, did, I went very quick through it. We support horizontal stacking on the 2960X. Did you see it? Nice. Uh, well, some customer, the market we were asking us for this since many years, our competitors did that, so we already have it. It can be a good, interesting. We call it horizontal stacking. We don't call it a stackwise virtual. It's different technologies, and we still need the module, stacking module. We don't do it with the front uplink ports, okay? This has some advantages as well, so if you need some help with that. I'm running out of time. Um, ETA we covered already. Who does permit ETA on the 9Ks? Basically, the x86 CPU-based platform. It needs enough horsepower to make this export of enhanced and advanced uh, fields in the NetFlow export, uh, like uh, initial data packets, uh, byte distribution, and so on. Uh, application hosting, we already mentioned this. And let me go very quick just for you to know that they exist. Ivor, I know this is your favorite topic. <laughs> Pricing, I will summarize, or maybe you can summarize in, in, in two minutes. Let's go with the 9K. I mean, if you make the numbers, and this is my personal message, make the numbers even with the 3K, even with the 2K at the access, if a stacking is needed, if full net flow is looked at from the customer as a, as a value, make your numbers with a 9K, there will be a difference, but small enough to discuss, negotiate, and try to bring a 9K. It, the difference from a technical perspective is so huge that I encourage you to fight that, that part because it's not really like it's the double or things like that, not at all. With the 3K, you will see it. If you don't need any SDA, you just lean land-based, okay, that price difference might you make more competitive. Once you need SDA, once you need even basic routing, the 9Ks will definitely be cheaper and will give you a, a, a conversation with the customer that nobody else has, okay? That's my summary, Ivor. And again, they did, the view did these nice numbers with details. Of course, you have to read the small letter, three years, not three years, what is included and not. But I think it's very interesting for you to, to start working on to, and to go prepare for a proposal. Uh, quick, quick, quick. Um, you see, you compare, you know, from 3K to 9K upsells, what does it mean? Less than 10% premium. From 2K, less than 25% or even 10%, depending on the platform. Uh, lead with modular. I like this slide. Why do we do stack-wise virtual and stack power? To simulate a modular platform, right? So this demonstrates that modular in the access has technically a lot of advantages. Of course, the, the stacking one has, you know, you pay as you grow and so on. But I like this slide because at the end, what we are trying to simulate with the stacking, with stack power and so on, is really to have the same as, as if I have a modular switch. And the numbers, at some point, the price per board will be very, very competitive. Um, whatever, sorry to go so quick, some more exercise. I think this is a very good to start making your exercise with your customer. Some promos, again, 9Ks with uh, access points. They give you five for the price of two. That rate is very interesting, but I have to go forward <laughs> and, <laughs> and I encourage you to, to read it uh, more carefully. And that's it. Sorry for being three minutes late. Any last question? May we have one question? Uh, there seems to be a bit of a gap in the core um, uh, kind of product line there in terms of a modular kind of uh, redundant supervisor option. Is that something that's uh, that's potentially coming, or are we taking a different approach there? This is a hot topic, recurrent question. What happens with the modular core options? Either there there is a gap, or there are too many options and no. Not, none of these options really covers all our needs, right? Let's put it this way. So right now, uh, keep with us uh, 6K, as I mentioned, if the density in terms of one gig and 10 gig is enough, we also have 40 gig with some oversubscription. It's right now for, again, a personal comment, my 
favorite platform. 9,400 might fit in commercial and small aggregation parts. And for very high density today, the Nexus 7K will be our best choice. This is what we have today. Will something come in the 9K platform? Because as we saw in the first slide, as the three pillars that I recognize as our, the pillars we depend on for innovation for the future, it's a matter of time. It's common sense, right? So it will come. But we, there is no concrete date yet. So I hope to see you in the next PVT and probably give you more information. Any other question? Yeah. A uh, question about the uh, DSS uh, part. If there still are two switches, or will that expand to three switches or four switches? You hear the question, VSS, two switches or more than two switches? Two switches. Okay. Only two switches, yeah. Okay, uh, Sean said that they are investigating more options. Actually, in the past, I remember four switches as well. The control plane, I guess, has some challenge, challenges from a technical perspective. So far, with two, with very, very low uh, convergence times and high port density, it should be enough, right? So at some point, but I agree with you, it might make sense, or having two stacks, physical stacks, being part of a single VSS and having these things make sense. But yeah, probably will come in the future. OK, thank you very much. And see you around. Thank you. So let, let's do 10 minutes break now.